Mary Advent. I don't know what else to say. It's just kind of the right thing to say because, well, here we are. It's the last Sunday of Advent, but it's the latest, the last Sunday of Advent ever gets. So I'm wearing a loose ball. We've got white parents, so we're kind of stepping right in the middle between Christmas and Advent. So let's celebrate. We're, we're here together to, to celebrate the Savior who was announced, who was promised for thousands of years, but but he who did come and fulfill all those promises uh, uh, will be just celebrating all day today. So we have our worship this morning. We also have worship at uh, 4.30, uh, uh, family worship at 4.30, also with candlelight. And, and at 10 o'clock this evening we have worship. And then, of course, tomorrow at uh, 10 o'clock we have worship as well. 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. Um, a couple of things before we begin. Um, I want to highlight the rather full hymn board. It could be fuller. The reason it could be fuller is because A, we don't have enough trees, B, we don't have enough room on the board. So I'm going to highlight to you if you go to page three in your bulletin, you will see opening hymn 356. Then you'll see him sing, one verse only, 361, 365, 368, etc., and the hymn of praise, 357. So the threes are there, except for the communion hymn. We took all the threes off, okay? So when you look, you'll see 61, that means 361. All the hymns today have a three in front of them. We are making them all Trinitarian without putting them on the board. So put those threes in front of the... Uh, in front of the number, okay? When we, especially during the hymn sing, I, I really wanted the numbers up there because we are not projecting today. So you're going to have to go analog today. No digital, you're going to have to go analog, which means that you need to use the hymn book today. So you'll be using Divine Service for page 203. I know that you guys who've been here on Sunday, we often have the, the numbers and everything up on the, on the screen. Not today. Uh, tonight at 4.30 we will, but not today, and so we will be using the hymn on page 203. Um, also, want to mention on the front page, when, before we begin our service, we're going to highlight the, 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 the sort of the message of the four candles. You'll see that on page 2 at the bottom is a reflection on the Advent candles. So we'll be doing that before the service. Now, Going later on, page five, you'll see some announcements there. I just want to highlight a couple of them. Um, begin with what a great celebration we had last week. I think I mentioned it uh, Saturday night. We had our granny uh, worshiping here. Uh, I had just a, a nice large group of them, and we were able to give out the Christmas gifts that you provided. If you didn't hear me say it last week, thank you for providing those for our granny young people and for our granny families. Uh, it was a really a great celebration, and uh, they were very appreciative of, of those of that kindness. Uh, they really enjoyed uh, the service as well. Um, I want to shout out a special thanks to Brian who stayed and played. He's here for Saturday night service and was, was kind enough to stay and play. But we're working for that. Dropping down, um, I want you to see. New edition of Luther's Small Catechism. Okay, so the catechism that you're used to having grown up with um, had questions and answers in the back. The first 30 pages, usually or so, was, was Luther. That's that little, little one we handed out this year also. That's all Luther. But the questions and answers in the back uh, over the years have been written by different people. Uh, lately, our Commission of Theology and Church Relations has done a full update of the questions and answers in the catechism. I think they did a really fabulous job, including uh, uh, questions and answers that are that are relevant to social issues today. So I would, I, I'd encourage you, if you if you want to, to take a look at that and see if that's something that you might like to have in your house. It just has a great uh, some scripture passages and answers to a lot of the common questions you might have. And so I, I'd encourage you to take a look at it. If you'd like us to order one for you, we would be happy to. Uh, you'll see that we are continuing to uh, collect for Bethany. 
can see what we're collecting there at the bottom. Um, and on the back of the bulletin, you'll see in color the, the names of those who have uh, helped adorn our altar area with, uh, with plants. We thank you for that. If you notice at the very bottom, it does say uh, uh, that you can take those tomorrow after the Christmas Day service. Uh, so that's all there. I think that's all I want to mention for today, unless somebody else has another announcement for the Good Work Congregation. But let's begin our worship with the, with the reflection of the Advent candle, page two, and then we'll, uh, we'll have the opening hymn, which is number 356. As we begin our worship, we've lit the last flame. As the circle of light has grown wider in the darkness of winter and our age. In this season, when we decorate our towns and homes with light and color, Let us deck the halls of our hearts with contrition and repentance, faith and confidence, deeds of compassion for the poor, acts of love and service to one another, and with kindness to friends and strangers. We join together singing in 356.
Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to the last life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgive you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For our psalm reading today, we're going to read together the first five verses of Psalm 89. If the psalm is the earlier part of the hymn. And again, it will just be the first five verses. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I will establish your offspring forever. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We continue with the Kyrie, and then we skip over the hymn of praise. Oh, I'm sorry. For the hymn of praise today, we will sing in 357. So we'll sing the Kyrie and then in 357.
The Lord be with you. Dear friends in Christ, from where I'm standing here today, it's very obvious that we as traditionalists generally come to the same pews that we are very comfortable with uh, week in and week out. Uh, this side is the <coughs> section of the congregation that travels. And as you can see, they're on their road and we ask God's blessings upon every one of them who travel today. St. Paul reminds us in Romans 16 why we are here and why we worship and what our single focus is. And he says it in these words. Romans 16, beginning with verse 25. Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, According to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him, to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Luke, the first chapter. Glory to you, Lord. 
In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please again be seated. This is where we have a medley of hymns. Uh, we start at 361 and go to 386. Again, the three is eliminated on the board, but we're just singing one verse of each of the hymns, just a, a taste of each one. 361 all the way to 386.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Text I read for today's meditation is from Luke, the first chapter. I read to you from verse 43 of the text, which is words of Elizabeth. She says this, But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Do you ever wish you were better? I look at myself in the mirror, say to myself sometimes, I wish I were better. I wish, for instance, I was a better pastor, that I could do things maybe more efficiently than I do, or maybe sometimes with a little more energy or skill. I wish I could be a better, a better preacher, Maybe not even have to have any notes for myself, but just be able to spew things out without having to have any notes at all. Or maybe I wish I were a better counselor, that I could just have people come and, and I could solve everybody's problems. I wish I were a better evangelist, boldly proclaiming the good news to, to all the people I encounter, taking a plane tomorrow, sit next to that guy, share the love of Jesus with him. I'd like to know how to make good decisions that would make everybody happy, so I'd like to be a better administrator. I'd like to be a better motivator, a better leader. I wish I were a better pastor. But let's not stop there. I wish I were a better husband, too. I wish that I showed more affection, more appreciation, more joy in my relationship. I wish that I were more self-sacrificial, more generous, more complimentary. I wish that I was better at fixing things around the house, that I was a bit neater, that I could see all the time what needed to be done and just ran to do it. And while I'm at it, I might as well mention that I wish I was a better father, a better brother to my siblings, a better friend to my friends. I wish I had been a better son to my parents. And probably most of all, I wish I were just a, a better person, that I didn't make mistakes, that I didn't fall into traps and snares, that I didn't find myself so often succumbing to selfishness and greed. I wish I were better. Better at everything. I know what you're thinking. It's Christmas and this guy's having a midlife crisis. <laughs> Maybe you're a little right, I don't know. But the reality is that as I read our text for this morning, I was struck by the words of Elizabeth. When approached by Mary in the hill country of Judea, Elizabeth proclaims, Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? I'm thinking to myself, hey, Elizabeth seems like a pretty good woman to me. Faithful, dedicated, our text says she's filled with the Holy Spirit. But clearly, she feels unworthy to be in the presence of the unborn babe, whom she remarkably confesses already, maybe even before Mary is showing, to be the Son of God. She feels unworthy. She wishes she were better. She wishes she could present a more deserving place for the presence of our Lord. It reminded me of a little of the Virgin Mary's words when told that she would be bearing the Son of God. How will this be, she says. And I think that she's not only referring to the fact that she's a, a virgin, but also the fact that she too is not worthy of bearing the Son of God. She's young. She's a sinner. And she's going to bear the perfect one. She wishes she were more worthy. I thought back to Moses at the burning bush. 
He hides his face from God and later says, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? I'm not eloquent. I'm slow of speech and tongue. Surely Moses, too, wished that he were a better vessel to be used by God. Isaiah, the super prophet, when approached by God, says, Woe is me, for I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Jeremiah, too, says much the same. Lord, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child, he says. Similarly, Amos, the less known prophet. I am neither a prophet nor a prophet's son, but a shepherd. And I also take care of sycamore fig trees. Three great prophets of God, yet when confronted with God's holiness and the magnitude of the task that lie before them as a servant of God, they cannot help but be confronted by their failures, by their faults, by their unworthiness, their inadequacy to be what God wants them to be. Here's the point. None of us are the best, or the brightest, or the finest. None of us are pure and perfect and holy. We all, like toads, have our warts. Let's face it. Our blemishes, our flaws, our weaknesses, our sins and our struggles. If Elizabeth and Mary and Moses and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Amos and so many others didn't deserve for God to use them as his instruments, then certainly we don't deserve it either. Who am I that God should choose me, we might say. But on this fourth Sunday in Advent, as we prepare for the coming of our Lord, his message to us is found in the words of Mary's Magnificat. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From generation to generation he's performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. God comes to us, to you and me. And in his grace and in his love, he is able to create a worthy instrument from that which is patently unworthy. He is mindful of the humble state of his servant. He lifts up the humble. He didn't just come to be Lord of the successful. He didn't just come to be Lord for the beautiful. He didn't just come to be Lord for the talented and gifted. He didn't just come for intelligent people. He didn't come to be Lord for the famous. He came for the forgetful and the mentally challenged. He came for the ordinary, those whose talents didn't make the evening news and aren't written up in the newspapers. He came for the messy. He came for the poor. He came for the stammering and the stumbling and those who might be considered by the world to be losers. He came for you and me. And he says to you and me, I want you to be my vessel. I want you to be my fingers and my voice. I want you to be my hands and my mouth. I want you to reach out to the world with the greatest news ever given to mankind. Look where he sends his son. Is he to be cradled in the finest embroidered bassinet in the palace of the king? No, his cradle will be the rough hewn wood of a feeding trough, the unimpressive dish of the beasts. Is he to be pampered by the well trained nannies of the royal family and treated as the king that he is to be? 
No, he is held and caressed by the hands of she who knew what it was like to do work and whose callous fingers, maybe, could barely ascertain the softness of newborn skin. St. Paul says it eloquently. God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one can boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. Therefore it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Qualification for receiving the Messiah is not our greatness, but his mercy. Not our strength, but his grace. Not our beauty, but his love. Not our intelligence, but his wisdom. So how do we respond to such news as this? There are numerous ways. First way seems a bit obvious. It's that of those who have trouble looking past their own unworthiness and inadequacy to see themselves as children of God and thus never present themselves to be used by him. How can I be his hands and voice, they say. I don't have the skills. I don't have the personality. I don't have the know-how, the wherewithal to do those things that he might actually want me to do. As Moses' line, I can't speak well, Lord. Send someone else, please. Jeremiah 2. God's reply to Moses, Jeremiah, who made your mouth? I will go with you. Do not be afraid. I will rescue you. I have put my words in your mouth. Then there's a second way of responding to God's message. We see it in the voices of the Pharisees and scribes as they confront the miracles and teachings of Jesus and the ministry of his disciples. As a cover for their own inadequacy, they seek to tear down, to rip apart, and to criticize. Look at those disciples. They're picking grain on the Sabbath day. Look at Jesus and his followers. He eats with tax collectors and sinners. Look at their inadequacy. Look at their warts. Because you see, if I focus on them, then no one will be looking at me. God's reply to them can be found in Mary's words in our text. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. Don't be a fool, he says. The fingers you point will come back and point back at you. The evil one loves to deceive you by getting your mind to look at others. Don't fall into that trap. Instead, confront your own faults and lay them down at the foot of the cross. For that's why this Savior came, to rescue. To rescue you from the traps and snares. There are other responses too. Preoccupation. Busyness. Apathy. Fear. These too have their way of halting the movement of God in our midst, putting the brakes on the breath of his spirit. But just when we think that all the shouting voices of unworthiness and inadequacy will dismantle the willing voices of God's people, enter the wondrous voice of Mary. Open hands. I am the Lord's servant, she says. May it be to me as you have said. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. 
That's the proper response of the people of God. To acknowledge who we are and in humility fall upon the cross of Jesus Christ as our confidence. And then recognizing what a tremendous confidence it is, enabling us to say, oh dear Lord, I don't know what you have in mind or what you have in store for me. I don't know where you're leading me. I only know that in Christ, I am made new. So let your, the wind of your spirit blow in the sails of my ship and lead me to be the person you want me to be. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Today, we approach the altar of God to receive from him the gifts of his body and blood. We come with our inadequacies. We leave with his confidence, competence. We come with our failures. We leave with his perfection. We come with our sins. We leave with his forgiveness. We come with our doubts, fears, frustrations. We leave with his hope and joy and peace. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. May those be your words too. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. <clears throat> And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Having heard the word of God, let us declare our Christian faith to him and to one another as we speak the words of our common confession of faith, the Nicene Creed. If you're following along in the book, it is page 206. 206. We join together. I believe in one God, <clears throat> the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead in the life of the world. You may be seated now as we receive you all.
In our prayers for today, one of those who are listening on page three, Mark Ware, the governor of the past place, and one who called his brother Joe and his cancer treatment. Got a shape of his father's recovery after the fall of the ladder, and he came out of the youth and said, Brother, he's recovering. 